Okay, I believe we are live. Hello, Artie Peoples, and welcome to another episode of Jerry's Live. My name is Emmy Klein, and I'm your host this evening. And as you can see, we have a guest with us tonight. Woo! Hello, everybody. Yeah. So everybody, welcome. Please welcome Jeff Olson onto the show. Uh, an amazing artist and um, the educator for uh, Royal Talents, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, Jeff has an amazing show planned for us all about the Cobra water soluble oils. I'm very excited about this. I know you guys have a lot of questions about water soluble oils, so pay attention. He's got a lot of information for us. Uh, but if you are interested in anything Jeff is going to be going over, make sure to go to the website, jerrysartorama.com and type in today's class code, which is JL308. So if you type that code into the search bar, the teacher's cart should come up and it gives you everything that we're covering. So you can check it out that way. So without further ado, though, I'm going to get myself off, off the screen and make Jeff bigger because you guys want to see all the fun things that he has for us. <laughs> awesome, Emmy. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so as Emmy said, we're going to be talking about Cobra. Uh, last time we were together, uh, I was talking about Rembrandt, which is one of our marquee uh, products, uh, one of the original products. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, but Cobra is a phenomenon uh, since its introduction. It's just grown in popularity. And every time I go out, I just get more and more questions about it. Matter of fact, I think I get asked more questions about Cobra uh, than I do about any of our other products. So I'm excited that we have this opportunity today. Uh, I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation with everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to go through a little bit of the history a little bit of the composition and working properties of the materials. I'm going to show you some examples of how this chemistry has been around literally for centuries. It's not something that's new. It's not something that just uh, uh, came about in the last uh, 50 years or so. It's something that's been around and part of the artist toolbox for centuries. So it's going to be fun to explore that. And then I've got some fun new products. Uh, they're going to be coming out in the future. Uh, that a lot of folks are going to be excited about some new mediums and then a fun new uh, event that actually just came out in September and that's a new movie if you like Loving Vincent there's a new movie by the same uh, film company called The Peasants and this movie is painted exclusively with cobra oil so I'm going to share some uh, uh, bits on that, uh, some details about the making of the movie, and I've got a clip uh, as well. So we'll have a fun time. And then, of course, always a giveaway at the end. So without further ado, as Emmy said, we're going to go ahead and jump into the presentation. I'm going to make the screen larger there. Uh, so here we are, join the revolution. Uh, Cobra water mixable oils. Ultimately, what it comes down to, what we're really talking about and what folks are most concerned about is solvent-free oil painting. So how do we work with oils, enjoy all the wonderful working properties of oils, uh, but banish those harmful solvents from our process? Oop, what do we got here? There we go. So why paint solvent-free? So this comes up a lot too. Like, you know, Why do I want to, or why would I? Uh, and these are the three things that come up most when folks are expressing a desire to uh, eliminate solvents from their process. The number one is health, of course. There are folks out there who just have zero tolerance for solvents. Uh, there are folks out there who don't have the studio, dedicated studio space with proper ventilation to be using solvents, or they're in a shared space with other people painting in the home, for example. Uh, so health is the number one reason. Solvents like turpentine, white spirits, and even odorless mineral spirits give off what we call VOCs, which can be harmful to you and the folks around you. So health is the number one reason. Uh, environment is second, equal to for a lot of folks. And uh, the disposal of solvents can be really troublesome. Uh, you can't just dump these out on the side of the road or down the drain. Uh, and depending on where you live, it can be harder than in other places. Uh, so the environmental impact of solvents and removing that from your process is very appealing to a lot of folks. And then finally, just convenience. Uh, I speak to a lot of plain air painters who love Cobra. Uh, one of the main reasons they don't have to worry about bringing solvents with them, especially if they're flying or they're going to some remote location or they're out somewhere where there's no place to, to dispose of solvents. So just lots of good reasons uh, folks are looking to paint solvent free. A little bit about Royal Talons before we go too much farther. Royal Talons is the manufacturer of Cobra. 
This is the original Royal Talents facility established in 1899 in Appledorn in the Netherlands. Appledorn is a wonderful little town, about an hour east of Amsterdam by train. Uh, we set up shop in this building. You can see the sign Talons and Co. Uh, we are still on the same piece of real estate, just different building. This is a look inside of the paint milling area in the 1930s. And I love these old pictures. Uh, you can't see it in this one, but a lot of them have a lot of the workers still wearing the Dutch wooden shoes. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, I love this picture. Uh, one of the reasons I love this picture is you can see that all of the paint mills back then were steam powered. The big wheels up here and the steam pipes and the belts coming down to the paint mills. Uh, so a total different type of automation than what we use today. Some of the first product lines that Royal Talents manufactured were our Rembrandt oils and watercolors. Here is the 1901 catalog picture of the Rembrandt watercolors. Rembrandt has been and still is our marquee brand. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of wonderful things around that brand in the coming years, so keep an eye out for that. Other products that Royal Talents manufactures includes Van Gogh, oils, watercolors, pastels, uh, Amsterdam, all acrylics, and Equiline liquid watercolors just to name a few. Uh, a lot of folks ask why we're called Royal Talons. You may have noticed on that original building, it just said Talons. In 1949, Queen Wilhelmina, pictured here, bestowed upon us the Royal Predicate. It was for our cultural and economic contributions to the Netherlands, and it didn't hurt that the Summer Palace for the Dutch Royal Family is in Appledorn, and Queen Wilhelmina was a novice uh, enthusiast painter herself. So we became paint makers to the Queen in 1949. Cobra was introduced in 2010, uh, our premium water mixable oils. It wasn't the first uh, water mixable oil that we produced. There was a Van Gogh water mixable oil, so that was earlier, uh, but we decided to create its own marquee brand, and there are two levels of Cobra available. There's the artist grade, which is what we're going to be talking about today, but there's also a study grade, an academic grade that's available too for folks who are looking to save a little bit more money. And then finally, Royal Town is North America. So our products have been available in the U.S. and Canada and Mexico since the 30s, uh, a little earlier than that, actually, uh, late 20s. And uh, uh, matter of fact, a wonderful anecdote here. I was in uh, New York about a year ago when there was a wonderful exhibition on Hopper, and he had his sketchbooks there, and he listed his colors. And after the end of the colors, he had in parentheses, Rembrandt. So he was using Rembrandt paint back then. So it was fantastic to see that kind of historical connection. Uh, but our products were always sold through a third party. So in 2015, Royal Talents North America was established in Northampton, Massachusetts. So now we can serve folks in the U.S. and Canada directly, our retail partners and artists alike. Uh, I am the Art Education Director, as Amy mentioned, uh, since 2017. I've got more than 25 years in the art materials industry. Uh, I used to teach uh, for a decade studio art and art history at the university, and I've been exhibiting my art for more than 30 years, and you can learn more about me at jeffolsonart.com. All right, so today, as I mentioned, why Cobra? And actually, I'm going to be talking a little bit here about why it's called Cobra. There are no poisonous snakes lurking in the canals of Amsterdam. So why Cobra? So I'll share that information. We're going to have a brief history of oil. So if you were with us last time when we talked about Rembrandt, uh, there's going to be some repeat here. Uh, but I've thrown in a few other fun facts for you. Uh, what is oil paint? Before we can talk about water mixable oil paints, we have to talk about what oil paint is, uh, and then we'll understand, or I hope uh, we'll all understand a little bit better about what's happening when we get to water mixable. I'm going to briefly talk about pigments, uh, but I'm going to spend more time on binders. Uh, binders for oils are what we refer to as the drying oils. So I'm going to share some of the most common drying oils that you would encounter today. Uh, water mixable oils then we'll jump into and I'll share with you what the chemistry is that creates this uh, wonderful effect uh, and the secret ingredient which we refer to as an emulsifier that makes it all happen. We're going to dive into that. Then we're going to look at the long history of emulsifiers in art. Uh, as I mentioned before this is not something that just appeared recently. It's been around for a long long time and I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, then I'm going to share with you the auxiliaries or the mediums that are available for Cobra. So give you an opportunity to see what you can add to the paint to enhance its working properties. Uh, then finally, we're going to dispel all those myths. There's so much misinformation out there about water mixable oils. 
Uh, and then also I have a couple tips for you if you're a first timer using them or even if you've been using them for a while. Uh, and then I'm going to share with you the information on the Peasants movie, some fun images. You're really going to enjoy that. And then as always, we're going to finish off with a Q&A and a giveaway. So we're going to be giving away some sets of Cobra along with some of the Cobra oil paper. Uh, so some great prizes uh, that we're going to give away a little quiz at the end. So make sure you stick uh, through it and stay tuned to the to the end of the talk. All right. And you and normally uh, that giveaway has something to do with the presentation that he's about to give. So pay attention. Absolutely. This is my bribe for folks to take notes and stick around. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So why Cobra? So why do we call it Cobra? You may have noticed uh, that many of our brands kind of tip their hat to Dutch art history or Dutch history in general. So we have Rembrandt oils, for example. We have Van Gogh watercolors. We have Amsterdam acrylics. Cobra is no different. Cobra was a post-World War II painting movement from the mid-40s into the early 50s. Uh, it was a group of painters from three different cities, Copenhagen, Brussels, and Amsterdam. And that's how they came up with the name. So they were known as the Cobra artists, and they had some wonderful manifestos that you should read if you get the chance. Uh, the type of painting that they did was not unlike uh, abstract expressionism that was happening uh, during the same period here in New York. They were looking to free themselves from the conventions of traditional oil. Uh, rather than history painting or traditional oil painting, they were looking at things like Nordic myths. They were inspired by surrealism, specifically automatism, which is that automatic painting kind of tapping into the subconscious. Uh, they were inspired by what they referred to as primitivism, which we would refer to more as outsider art today. Uh, this is a wonderful quote from Carol Apple, who was the Dutchman of the group. We didn't want to be understood. We want to be freed. And you will notice on a lot of the packaging for Cobra, we have a saying, infinite freedom. So we're taking this idea of being freed from conventions, in this case, the conventions of painting with solvents, uh, to a new uh, enjoyment of the medium. All right, so brief history of Vulcan. This is my super, super brief history, uh, but we got to go back to the beginning uh, and the oldest known oil paintings. So a lot of folks think about oil painting as beginning during uh, the Renaissance, and there certainly was a rebirth of it, and we'll talk about that. But the oldest known paintings that we have were discovered here. These are some caves. Uh, actually, this is a site in the Bamiyan region of Afghanistan. Uh, you may remember this uh, from back in early 2000s. Uh, the Taliban blew up these monumental carvings uh, of Buddha that were on the side of this mountain, a horrible tragedy. Uh, the silver lining was that behind them were discovered this network of caves. And in these caves were these wonderful murals uh, of the life cycles of Buddha. And when they analyzed them, they discovered that these were oil paintings. They were a combination of walnut oil and poppy seed oil mixed with pigment. And the results were incredible. Uh, and they were able to date them back to the seventh century. So we're talking several hundred years before the Renaissance. So a wonderful discovery, uh, really adding to our understanding of oil painting. We're not sure whether these paintings were a one-off or not. Most likely, there are predecessors. Uh, this part of Afghanistan during the 7th century was a crossroads in, in trading from the west to the east. Uh, artisans and artists from uh, India, today India and China, uh, were going back and forth with uh, artists and tradesmen from the West. And so there could be a lot of different reasons why these appeared at that time there. Uh, but certainly the level of execution leads us to believe that there are probably other oil paintings out there. Maybe they just haven't survived or we haven't discovered them yet. When we get to the 15th century in Europe, uh, then we see the oil painting that we're all familiar with. Uh, oils actually were part of the painting process in European painting before this. In late Gothic periods, oils were used, just not in the way uh, they were at this time. There was a real revolution of techniques, especially in the North. Netherlandish painters, uh, such as Jan van Eyck pictured here, he and his brother Herbert really revolutionized the use of it. You can see the wonderful image from the Ghent altarpiece, the central panel in the background here that they created. Uh, a few of the things that they were doing, along with another group of northern painters, they were taking that oil painting, and there were four main things that they did to it that were completely different than what it had done before. The first and probably most important is they were polymerizing the oil. So they were essentially heating it up, cooking it up, if you will, and that changed the consistency and the working properties of it. 
they were also adding resins uh, to it. So they were adding other ingredients. These resins helped to thicken it, creating something akin to what we call stand oil today. Uh, there were also uh, solvents that were new, turpentine. Turpentine had been around, but it wasn't available widely. And it wasn't used in the painting process in the same way. Uh, that is a solvent uh, to create lean layers of paint. Uh, so a new use, a new discovery of a new solvent really changed the game for folks. Uh, and then finally, they were adding something we refer to as sicatives or a drying agent, something that would speed up the drying of the paint. Uh, and this really changed the game. So see you, you see here in this early development of oils, a chemistry, an experimentation, alchemy, if you, if you will, uh, with the medium itself, evolving it, kind of bending it to their will to create a new effect or a new result. Uh, the uh, counter to this, or the most popular mediums prior to them coming about, were fresco, which we see in the left, and tempera on the right. Fresco is painting directly into plaster. Uh, tempera is using egg yolk as the binder and adding pigment to it. Uh, but there were limitations to it. And with oils and these new techniques that were developed for artists like Van Eyck, and here we see Van der Weyden, uh, was a new realization uh, of imagery, a greater sophistication, if you will, uh, the use of layers, what we refer to as glazing today, creating this finely detailed realism. Uh, the versatility of oil paint made or became an essential factor in realizing the artistic goals of artists during the Renaissance kind of combine this extraordinary naturalistic detail with brilliant color, a tonal variation that wasn't possible in fresco or tempera, uh, and in the words of Van Eyck himself, the beauty of earthly things. Another thing that we don't talk about a lot that was definitely important to how we understand painting materials today was the development of the paint tube. Uh, so in 1841, a gentleman named John Rand developed the first paint tubes. In the background, you can see how paint was stored and transported prior to that. These are little pig bladders uh, that uh, are holding the paint. These, this image is actually from Gainsborough Studio uh, in the UK. Uh, not exactly the easiest way to, to move paint around or to the convenience of painting, uh, but the development of this new tube in 1841 changed the game. And not just for professional artists, really democratized painting. Uh, it created uh, a whole enthusiast movement, a group of novice painters, organizations and clubs were formed around oil painting that still exists today. Uh, it contributed to plain air paintings popularity. Uh, a lot of folks contribute the development of the tube to helping the impressionists uh, develop their ideas and vocabulary. So the paint tube really was revolutionary. Uh, also, it changed the way uh, that paint was manufactured. It went from being hand done in artist studios or in the studios of colorists or colormen, it was called, uh, to being manufactured in mass. Uh, this helped to uh, create consistency from batch to batch and improve the overall quality. Uh, of course, you, it did distance the artists from that process of making the paint themselves. So there, there's probably something lost there. But the gains uh, in terms of the consistency and quality in the paint and the availability of the materials to a broader audience certainly were significant in changing our ideas about oil painting today. So what is oil paint? Uh, the primary ingredients of oil paint are the coloring agent, and almost always it's a pigment. Dyes can be used, but dyes are fugitive. They're not light fast. So pigments are preferred in an artist-grade oils paint. And then the binder. Uh, so all paints have a coloring agent and a binder. Coloring agents are universal. Pigments are in the same in oils as they are in acrylics and watercolors. It's the binder that is different. And for oils, we use the drying oils, and we'll talk about those a little bit more. Uh, some of the other ingredients that are used in the manufacture of paint uh, can include extenders or fillers. These are used in a lot of academic paints. Uh, they can be used to bulk up the paint to, to make it a little thicker, heavier body. Uh, things like talc or mar marble dust or calcium carbonate are added uh, as pigment replacements uh, in student grade paints. Stabilizers can be added. Uh, every pigment has a different character uh, and its reaction to the oil. We call it surface tension. Uh, and so things like aluminum stearate can be added to help stabilize the pigment so it doesn't separate from the binder. 
solvents can be added. Some manufacturers add solvents uh, in their paints to uh, alter or enhance the working property of the paint. That can be turpentine or white spirits. Uh, resins are used uh, often, again, to change the consistency or the working properties. Uh, and finally, sicatives, which I mentioned already. Uh, I mentioned resins as well in terms of Von Eich's use. So these, these ingredients go back to the origins of Western oil painting. Sicatives are used as drying agents, uh, and there are different types. Uh, some can uh, increase the depth of the drying, and others uh, can increase the surface drying. So different types do different things. The pigments, just briefly, and here's some wonderful pictures of the pigments uh, in our facility. Uh, this picture doesn't do it justice. These colors just glow. It's like there's a light emanating from them. Uh, pigments are characterized typically by their origin. So we have pigments that are organic pigments coming from plants or animals. We have inorganic pigments that are minerals, and those are some of the oldest pigments, like the oxides. And then finally, synthetic pigments, which make up most of our palette today. Synthetic pigments begin as either being organic or inorganic and then are synthesized or cooked up the same way Van Eyck cooked up his oil uh, to create new colors or enhance the working properties of those, uh, sometimes to find less expensive alternatives to more expensive natural ones. So binder, this is where we're going to get into the meat of our discussion today. So what is a binder? So pigments are the one main ingredient mixed with binder, the other main ingredient. So the definition, if you're to look it up, uh, is a liquid substance that hardens through a chemical or physical process. Uh, so this is true of almost all binders, not all paint binders, but almost all binders, and certainly true for oils. Uh, the primary functions of a binder in any type of paint are to suspend and adhere. Uh, so that binder uh, takes that pigment and suspends it or holds it in place. Pigments don't dissolve in the binder. Uh, dyes dissolve. They're like sugar or salt mixed with water. They dissolve. Uh, but pigments are more like sand. If you stir them up in water, they disperse, but eventually they sink back down to the bottom. So a binder has to hold those pigments in place when it's been stirred up. So we call that suspension. And then the other is adhesion. That has to stick to the surface that you're painting on, right? We see the brush loading up some paint on the canvas here. Uh, it has to stick. So almost all binders are also excellent adhesives. Finally, it's the binder that gives any paint its primary working properties. So whether it dries quickly, whether it's permeable or impermeable, uh, what it will mix with all goes to the binder. The pigments are universal, the binders are unique and give each medium its primary working properties. So let's look at the binders for oil paints. There are a group of oils that we refer to as the drying oils. The drying oil is one that hardens or dries to a hard and strong durable film. We want a permanent paint film. It will hardens through a chemical reaction referred to as oxidation. And that's really the, the correct term. Oil paintings don't dry, they oxidize. And what does that mean? Uh, acrylics, watercolors, they dry. Uh, there's evaporation that's taking place. There's water in the binder. There's water that the artist adds that evaporates off and the paint film is formed that way. With oil, the drying oil is actually absorbing oxygen from the atmosphere, creating a hard, strong, durable film. And it's a much slower chemical process. Some of the drying oils that you would encounter today and some that have been around for a long time include linseed oil. Uh, you can see the picture of the beautiful amber color of linseed in the back. Linseed comes from the flax seed, and you can see it pictured here. Uh, it's been uh, the most popular binder for oil paints uh, since the Renaissance. Linseed oil, uh, actually just, just wanted to throw this in there too. A lot of people ask me, why don't you call it flaxseed oil? Because it, you know, since it comes from flaxseed. Linseed or lin is actually the Old Norse, Old English word for flax. So you think of a linen shirt or a linen canvas, for example, that word lin is is the word flax, just in another language. So some, some fun information there, fun anecdotal information. I'm, I'm full of them. <laughs> so linseed oil uh, dries relatively fast compared to others. I know that sounds uh, strange since linseed oil takes days, sometimes weeks just to tack up and, and months to dry it thoroughly. But compared to the other drying oils, it's relatively fast. Uh, it makes the hardest, most durable paint film out of all of the drying oils, which is why it's preferred. The only downside to linseed oil is it can yellow over time, depending on the pigment it's mixed with, 
and how much oil uh, is in the mixture, that effect can be uh, enhanced or increased. It can also be mitigated. Uh, and one of the number one ways to mitigate it is to include safflower oil in the mixture. You'll notice that a lot of the whites that you use, it's true with some of the whites that we make, uh, it's true for the cobra white, safflower oil is added and that helps to mitigate the yellowing of those colors so you don't notice it as much. Uh, safflower oil comes from this wonderful thistle flower uh, pictured here. <clears throat> it has a longer drying time than linseed oil, so it's a little slower drying. You'll notice that your whites sometimes take longer to dry when it has safflower oil in it. If you're adding safflower oil as a medium into your paint, it takes a little bit longer to dry. Uh, so that's one feature of the safflower oil. Uh, it makes a good paint film, but not as solid as linseed. Uh, so it's not often used as the primary binder. It's usually added in as a secondary binder, uh, uh, usually to mitigate yellowing. Walnut oil is also a very popular oil and has been since the Renaissance. Walnut oil uh, is fast drying, uh, similar to linseed. Uh, it's non-yellowing, so it has an advantage there. It has good endurance uh, and makes a nice strong paint film. It's also often used to replace solvents. Some artists use walnut oil in the place of a solvent. Solvents are really defined through their use, not necessarily by their chemical makeup. Uh, the only downside to walnut oil is that it can rot. Uh, of course, if you're painting it on your painting, your painting isn't going to rot, but that jar of walnut oil sitting in the corner of your studio can go bad and you will know it because it smells horrible. Uh, and then finally, poppy seed oil. Poppy seed oil has been around. Uh, I mentioned its use uh, in those uh, murals painted or discovered in Afghanistan. Uh, it's a lighter oil. It's used a lot uh, in whites and also in the making of varnishes. Uh, it's non-yellowing. Uh, much slower drying, probably slower than all these others. So there's uh, an advantage to using that if you really like to do a lot of blending over time. So these are the four drying oils that you will come in uh, contact with most today. So what are water mixable oils then? So water mixable oils are also referred to as water miscible. You'll hear me go back and forth in that. They're essentially the same thing. Water soluble is another term that's used a lot. These revolutionary paints have all the characteristics of traditional oils, but without the need for harmful solvents and other dangerous chemicals. So you can use them uh, in any painting technique that you're used to painting with your traditional oils, only now you can replace the solvent with water. Uh, water mixable oils are genuine oil paints. They're formulated with a drying oil binder, linseed oil in the case of Cobra. So it's a true oil paint. Unlike traditional oil paint, this binder has been modified so that it can be mixed with water. Uh, the additive that's introduced acts as an emulsifier and it allows for the oil to bond with water to form a stable suspension. Uh, so let's take a deeper dive on what this idea is. What is an emulsifier and what's happening to the paint and what's the history of that? So an emulsifier, uh, to define it generally, uh, is an agent or compound or substance uh, that acts as a stabilizer uh, in an emulsion. And an emulsion is typically where you have two different ingredients, two different liquids uh, that don't normally mix with each other, like oil and water. Uh, the word comes from the Latin to milk. Uh, to milk uh, or milk itself is a type of an emulsion. It's a mixture of water and fat. Uh, another word for emulsifier is emulgent. Uh, emulsifiers are commonly found in nature. Milk's a perfect example. Egg yolks are another emulsion. Uh, they're in our bodies. Uh, they're found er everywhere in nature, and they're used a lot in food products and pharmaceuticals. Uh, they're really a part of our modern life and have been a part of life for many, many centuries. Uh, so on a molecular level, if you look at what that emulsifier is doing, uh, you see this diagram here. Uh, the molecule of the emulsifier has two unique ends. One is what we refer to as hydrophilic, literally in Greek, water-loving. And the other is lipophilic, literally fat or oil loving tail. So here's our fat molecule in the water. The emulsifier attaches itself to the fat and bonds it with the water. So that's what's taking place. That's how we can mix our oil paint with water. Uh, the inclusion of this emulsifier makes that possible on a molecular level. Now, uh, I do have one quick question sure. um, that I just wanted to make sure we clarify because I had a question in the chat 
somebody was asking, does that mean it would crack while it's curing because it's water-based? Now, this is not water-based. It's not water-based. There's no water in the paint itself. There's no cracking. The only water is what you add to it, and the water evaporates away just like solvents, like white spirit evaporates away, leaving a linseed oil binder. Yeah. So it's still an oil paint. You add the water, the water evaporates, and then you're still left with an oil paint. You're left with a linseed oil binder that creates a wonderful paint film. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I would add that these paints have been tested more than any other paint in history. <laughs> they've yeah. been tested in our labs. They've been tested in other manufacturers' labs. They've been tested in major museums and art institutions. Uh, the archival quality is not in doubt on these products. They are absolutely archival. Uh, and they are going to respond uh, as well as you apply them, just like with a traditional oil painting. You can screw up traditional oil painting by adding too much uh, binder, too much solvent, and, and do things, paint on a ground that isn't prepared properly. Uh, those are really the culprits, not the paint. All right, so let's talk about the history of emulsifiers. I mentioned that there's centuries behind this, so let's look at some of the examples. I've mentioned tempera painting already. So tempera is an egg yolk, and we mix the pigment with it, and we use water as the vehicle. And the reason we can mix water with this egg, which is an animal protein and animal fat, is because it has a naturally occurring emulsifier inside of it called lecithin. And that's what allows the water to mix with it. The water evaporates out and the egg hardens and creates the paint film. Uh, so an example uh, of a type of emulsion in painting that dates back uh, for centuries. Even older is casein. Casein, uh, is a type of paint that's made from a milk protein. Uh, the milk protein is mixed with the pigment and water is used as a vehicle. The ancient Egyptians used casein. Casein is still a, a wonderful paint with and available today. Uh, casein uh, relies on the emulsifier within the milk itself. Uh, and that's what allows you to add water to it. So another example of an emulsion. A more contemporary example uh, is uh, soy. Soy pictured here is a drying oil. Soy is what they use uh, when they make alkyd resins. Uh, they synthesize the soil with alcohol and acid to create that alkyd resin. Uh, soy is a drying oil. It's very slow drying. It doesn't make a very strong paint film on its own, uh, but when mixed with other colors, it has non-yellowing features. And it also has the unique quality of carrying that same uh, uh, emulsifier that the egg yolk and the milk have it, it contains lecithin. You'll see soy lecithin as an ingredient in many food products. Uh, so soy oil is actually water mixable. So a really fun fact there. It's used in paint making. I mentioned alkyds. It's not really used as a binder for paint by itself because it doesn't have the same features that we need like we find in linseed oil, but it is used in the manufacture of paints and it does have that quality. Now I did a little homework here recently it was kind of a discovery looking for something else. Uh, but I have this book right here. I got it at a garage sale probably 30 years ago. It's called The Painter's Question and Answer Book, and it's by Frederick Tobbs. Uh, and here's a picture of the cover of it. You can still get this on Amazon. It was published in the 40s. Tobbs uh, is an interesting figure uh, from American art history. Uh, for most of us, the name Frederick probably rings a bell. Frederick lent his name uh, to the making of canvas. So Frederick's canvases are named after this particular artist. He was a great teacher in New York City, uh, wonderful oil paintings that he created, but he was really knowledgeable and shared his knowledge as a teacher in the making and use of all painting materials, including oils. He paired up with some other artists, including Thomas Hart Benton, to create this book. And as I was paging through it, looking for something else, I came upon this section uh, called miscellaneous media and methods. I'm going to read from what I have here. Uh, in chapter 21, there's a section called oil tempera painting. Uh, and he defines it as the introduction of oil into the egg water medium. Uh, he goes on to say, general uses include creating an underpainting for traditional oil or for creating an entire painting. Uh, he defines and describes what an emulsion is. So what we just talked about, about an emulsifier, he talks about as well. And then he gives a formula, and I think this is fun. And I've tried this uh, similar uh, ratios before, uh, but it was fun to find this exact formula. So in the water emulsion, oil in a water emulsion may be thinned with water if you start with two parts egg yolk, three parts water, and one part stand oil. Stand oil is a type of uh, synthesized linseed oil. 
Uh, further down, we see the following question posed. He says, are the pigments ground into the emulsion or does the emulsion serve as a painting medium? And he says the answer, the emulsion is a binder for the pigments as well as a painting medium, although one may thin the paints with thinned emulsion or with water. So here's an example, and I'm so excited that I found this, of an artist uh, in the 20th century, not just an artist in medieval times using what was called the guazzo technique of painting oils over tempera. Here is an intentional mixture of an emulsifier into oil paintings to allow the use of water as a vehicle. Uh, and just wonderful to see it, and, and especially to show that he's using it to make paint as well as to use it as a medium that he's adding to paint. Uh, I also found this wonderful picture. There's an example on Kremer, uh, a wonderful source for pigments in the US in New York City, an example of this same type of oil tempera painting method. Uh, so information is out there uh, that talks about this. So water mixable oils uh, are something that has a long history uh, in the Western tradition and beyond. All right, so let's skip over uh, to some of the mediums. So a lot of artists like to enhance the working properties of the oils with mediums. You can use any traditional oil medium with Cobra. Uh, the only issue is that by doing so, you will mitigate its ability to mix with water. So we have created a line of mediums that can help you to adapt the consistency of the paint, the transparency of the paint, uh, the drying time, and the finish of the painting. Uh, and listed here are the ones that are currently available, the painting medium uh, 091, the glazing medium 92, quick dry medium 93, and the painting paste 87. And there are also some spray varnishes. So let's look at them individually real quickly. So the painting medium is the most popular uh, and the one I recommend to folks who are looking for a medium to try out. It's very similar to what an artist would do with traditional oils. They'd mix a little linseed oil with a little solvent together, put that beside their easel and use that. Uh, to dip their brush into or to mix into the paint uh, to create a more fluid mixture, uh, as well as having some other advantages, including uh, changing or increasing the gloss and the transparency of the paint. Whenever you add more oil to paint, you make it glossier. Uh, it increases the durability of the paint. Whenever you're adding more oil to paint, you make the paint film stronger. It also makes the paint fatter. So for folks who are layering or glazing techniques, adding this medium will make the paint fatter and allow for that type of layering. Uh, it can be thinned with water also, just like the paint. So you don't lose any of that water mixability by adding this. Uh, and as with all mediums that contain linseed oil, if you add a lot of this, you're going to increase the chance of yellowing in lighter colors and whites. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's, that's a general rule for all oil painters that you should be aware of. Uh, anytime you're adding a lot of linseed oil into your paint, you increase the chance of yellowing. You're not going to notice it in most colors, but you will notice it if you're using a lot of whites or lighter valued colors. The glazing medium has all the same working properties uh, that we saw in the painting medium with the uh, addition uh, of making the paint self-leveling. Uh, so for folks who are doing glazing, they're really typically looking for that nice smooth surface. Uh, that glass-like surface that captures the light, right? Uh, so the glazing medium is made for that. It's also much fatter uh, than the painting medium, so it really lends itself to building up multiple layers of glazes. Then we have the quick dry medium, which is quickly becoming the most popular, no pun intended there. Uh, shortens the drying time as the main distinguisher from the painting medium. So it has all the same features of the painting medium, and it includes shortening the drying time by about 20 to 40%, depending on how much you're adding into it. Really nice if you're out playing or painting or traveling, uh, speed up that drying time. It can be used with glazing too and, and uh, shorten the amount of time you have to wait before you put on the next glaze. The painting paste, my personal favorite. Uh, the painting paste retains the viscosity. So I like to describe it as the paint without the pigment. Uh, so it, you mix this with your paint, you keep that nice buttery texture. It doesn't make it more fluid like the others do. Uh, it increases the transparently like the others. Uh, it doesn't increase the gloss. This is a feature I like. Anytime you're adding linseed oil, typically with these other mediums, you increase the gloss of the paint. This is one that you can add to the paint to extend it without changing the sheen. It has the same gloss as the paint itself. It does make the paint fatter. Although most often it's used in all the Prima techniques, especially with palette knife, uh, it can be thinned with water. And again, with the others, it can uh, add more yellowing uh, as it does include more linseed oil. 
and new in 2023. So these are going to be available towards the end of this calendar year. Most retailers, uh, and especially Jerry's, will have these in the winter time. Uh, and I encourage you guys check them out. They are exciting. We've been waiting for some of these for a long time. The first is a brush cleaner. Now, of course, you can clean your brushes with soap and water really easily with Cobra. This has the added uh, uh, feature of conditioning as well. Uh, so it helps prolong the life of your brush by using this brush cleaner. Uh, the uh, water mixable safflower oil, linseed oil, none of the other uh, mediums that we use uh, can be used to make your own paint. These two can be used to make your own paint, or you can mix them with water in different ratios to create your own mediums. Uh, so really nice to have that, really kind of uh, creating that opportunity to do some more traditional type of painting techniques uh, and auxiliaries that folks are used to. Uh, probably the most exciting for a lot of folks is the Cobra medium mix. So you can add this to any type of traditional oil paint and make it water mixable. Uh, this will make it really easy for folks who are transitioning into water mixable paints. All that investment you have in traditional oils, you can add this to it and make them water mixable as well. Uh, or if there's a color out there and a brand that you just love and it isn't available in Cobra, you can add this to it and make it water mixable and use it with the other paints. A really wonderful product. Uh, and then finally, the solvent-free paint thinner. So you use water typically uh, with Cobra to thin it, uh, to create those lean layers, your underpainting, for example. Uh, we created this because the way that the water interacts with the paint is not how a lot of folks are used to when using a solvent with the paint. Uh, this creates or reflects that same feeling that you would have mixing turpentine or a white spirit with the paint. So you can add this to the paint, uh, create those wonderful uh, washes of color or underpainting uh, that you can work back into. Uh, so you can use it to make your paint leaner, uh, more transparent. It mixes with water, uh, non-toxic, no solvents. So a wonderful product for folks who like to do those techniques. I am very excited about that one. Aren't those both, fun? Of, both of those last two. Yeah. Uh, now yeah. I do have a couple of questions regarding mediums in particular that have been coming up. So I know you talked about the 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 paste. Someone was asking if there is something like or if you could mix in beeswax into your cobra paints and kind of how what would be the end result with that? Right. Or would you suggest using more of the paste? Because I would guess the beeswax would probably make it thicker than the so paste. You would. certainly can. You can as be you can add beeswax to the paint. Uh, a lot of folks ask, ask me if you can use cold wax. Some of our ambassadors use cold mm -hmm. wax with Cobra. You can add all those things and get the same effects that you would with a traditional oil. Adding those materials though does mitigate the water miscibility. Um, so the more wax you add, the more cold wax you add to the paint, the less water miscibility you'll experience. And then you'll be working with essentially a traditional oil paint. Uh, cold wax, I should remind folks, does contain some solvents in it. So if you're looking to get away from solvents, cold wax is, is probably something you, you don't want to be using. But beeswax, you definitely could add to the paint. The more you add, though, the less water miscible it is. Yeah. Now, um, along the same lines, because you're talking about the uh, solvent that's in the, the cold wax. Um, are all of the Cobra mediums non-toxic? Yes, non-toxic. Uh, they do not contain uh, any solvents. Uh, they're a combination primarily of linseed oil with some uh, another organic uh, resins. So they're completely uh, safe, uh, no VOCs uh, to speak of. The only odor that comes from them is from the linseed oil. So you get that kind of wonderful linseed oil smell that old painters love. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there's there's no toxins in them. Uh, they're not combustible. Uh, they are flammable, like oil paint's flammable, but they're not combustible. They, they still don't fly if you're going on an um, airplane. Actually, yeah, actually, there's they don't, they are safe to fly with, although... Really? Talking to your TSA agent may be challenging <laughs> if they discover them, right? Um, yeah. There's usually to not be able to go on the plane, they'll have that little fire image on it, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll see that on solvents. That is not on these. So they are an AP product, approved product, um, and they are not combustible. And so they are allowed uh, or they should be allowed on flights. Now, mm -hmm. 
for the folks who travel a lot, I travel a lot. Not every TSA checkpoint is the same, right? Some folks see a tube of pain and have no problem with it. Other folks see a tube of pain and want you to put it in your check luggage. Yeah. Um, but if you're flying and you put it in your check luggage, you no problem with doing that. <clears throat> and an extra level of precaution would be simply just to print up the MSDS sheet, which is available on the Royal Talents website, dropping that into your suitcase with it. And so if anybody at TSA opens your suitcase when, and when it's checked, they'll see that that they're fine. Yeah, I highly suggest anybody do that for any type of art supply, just in case. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're going somewhere remote where you're not going to be able to purchase new materials. Yes. Uh, definitely take that extra step. Great advice. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I have a couple of other questions about like brushes being used with this uh, Cobra water soluble. Oil paint. Yeah, so um, the, the most recommended brushes are synthetic blends. Mm -hmm. um, synthetic brushes, leaps and bounds for what they were 20 years ago. You know, contemporary synthetics are great brushes. Um, but you can use all your traditional oil brushes, uh, your sables and, and those. Because water is used, a lot of folks don't like to have uh, bristle brushes, hog hair brushes. You know, hog hair brushes are are sensitive to the water, they absorb a lot of the water, it can damage the brush over time. Um, really though, proper maintenance of your brushes can control that, you know, don't leave your brushes sitting in water, for example, um, making sure they're cleaned and dried at the end of every painting session, things like that will mitigate that. Um, but most often, uh, we, as well as other manufacturers, water municipal uh, oils, will recommend synthetic brushes. But I use bristle brushes. I use, I have a couple of sables I use with them too. Uh, and I haven't had any problems. You know, it's all about brush maintenance. Very true. Now, uh, talking about uh, brushes still, uh, would you have any issue between switching with the brush from these water mixable oils to a traditional oil? Not at back. all, not at all, now, back and forth. And actually there's a ratio. So I will share it uh, in an upcoming slide too, but you can mix Cobra with a traditional oil. And if you maintain a four to one, I've even found it works at two to one, two parts Cobra, one part traditional oil, uh, and it's still water miscible. So I, I can mix a color that I don't have in Cobra from my Rembrandt. Uh, together and I can still paint with that and add water. So there's nothing in the chemistry of Cobra uh, that would not allow you to mix it back and forth with the traditional oil. It's all about the ratio. If you get too much of the traditional oil into the mixture, it's going to start to repel uh, the water. Um, so that's what you would notice and then you can adjust it from there. But there are not going to be any adverse effects by going back and forth. And uh, I did see a question in here of asking about the same thing but from the water soluble cobra oils to acrylics. Can you that's switch a no -no. brushes? Yeah, that's a no-no. So actually, let me go through the slide because I'm gonna oh, answer perfect. a bunch. Yeah, I'll go through a bunch of these perfect. and if I haven't answered one, we'll come back to it. We're jumping ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so myths, tons of misinformation out there. So the first is that they contain water. This came up already, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That is false. These paints do not have any water in them. They're the linseed oil binder that's been synthesized with the emulsifier and pigment. Uh, and uh, that is it. There is no uh, solvents in them, no water in these paints. They're not water-based. They're water mixable. Mm -hmm. uh, that they're not a true oil paint. That is false. As we shared all the way back to Van Eyck and Van der Weyden, artists have been synthesizing their binders to create new working properties and adding other ingredients to create new working properties. And I, as I shared from the book uh, uh, from the 1940s, artists have known of the ability to mix emulsifiers with oil paint to make them water mixable. These are true oil paints. The uh, binder being synthesized with emulsifier does not take that away. Uh, it'd be like saying if you mixed alkyd medium with your oil paint that you're not an oil paint anymore. Uh, and and it's, that's just not true. Uh, that they dry faster than traditional oils. A lot of folks think, oh, I'm using water, so it must be like acrylic. And that is false. These dry at the same rate. Actually, I think slower in some cases, depending on how much water you add. Uh, the paint itself is going to dry at the same rate. So if you're just out of the tube, uh, apples to apples, it's the same drying time. Water evaporates more slowly than solvents do. So if you're used to adding a lot of terp or a lot of white spirits uh, to your paint, that spirit evaporates really quickly. Uh, water a little bit slower. 
so it can take a little bit longer for those lean layers to dry if you're adding a lot of water to it. Now, actually, I have a quick question more sure. for my own curiosity. With that new medium that thins it down, will that dry faster? Yes. Because it's going to evaporate out? Yep. So, so it's, it's going to behave more like what you're used to mixing a solvent with the paint. Plus, okay. you don't have to worry about the ratio. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that they cannot be mixed with traditional oils. We've already mentioned this several times. You can absolutely mix these with any other oil paint that's out there without any adverse effects. It's all about maintaining the water miscibility, depending on how much you mix. Uh, that they work like acrylics, and that's false. They do not work like acrylics. I mentioned how acrylics dry through evaporation. These dry through oxidation. These are a true oil paint. They're going to have all the working properties and features of an oil paint. They're nothing like acrylics. Uh, that they can be mixed with acrylics, and that is false. Now, there are some brands out there who say that's okay, and you certainly could squeeze out some acrylic paint and squeeze out some Cobra and mix it on your palette and paint with it, and you wouldn't notice anything. But we at Royal Talons, uh, based on the way these two different binders dry, one rapidly through evaporation and one slowly through oxidation, uh, can't guarantee the integrity of the paint film down the road. Nothing may happen, or your paint could crack, it could peel, uh, the acrylics could suffocate the oil, not allowing it to oxidize correctly. All sorts of potential tragedies uh, by mixing the two together. So while it's physically possible to mix them on your palette and apply them to the surface, the long term of this mixture is suspect, uh, to say the least. Uh, finally, that they're not archival, that they don't last as long as traditional oils, and that's false. These have the same light fast pigments, uh, highest light fast rating, 100 plus years under museum light conditions. Uh, the binder has been tested and tested. I would say that the paint here, the Cobra, is going to be a longer lasting paint than what Van Eyck mixed up in his studio uh, or any artist for, you know, 500 years after that fact. Today's modern oil paints, modern manufacturing practices uh, are probably the best ever in history. Uh, and that they have less pigment, that somehow the emulsifier mitigates or changes the amount of ratio of pigment to binder, and that's false. Uh, there's no difference in the absorption of the oil into the pigment or the surface tension of the pigment. That's all the same. The same pigments are used. Uh, there's not less color in these because they're a water mixable paint. I think this mis myth comes from the fact that the earlier generations of water mixable oils that were introduced in the marketplace back in the 70s were not heavily pigmented. They weren't marketed towards professional artists. They were seen as a product that would give hobbyists or enthusiasts a way to paint with oils without having to use solvents. Um, uh, so they didn't make them as an artist grade paint. And so folks tried those out and were not satisfied with the results. Uh, today's artist quality water miscible oils are very heavily loaded with color uh, and get some wonderful results. Couple of quick tips. Uh, when using Cobra mediums, moderation, moderation, moderation. Uh, always start out, maybe just dip your brush in a little bit and mix it with the paint and see how you like it and what it does to the paint. Um, you can mix them in any ratio, uh, but I always recommend moderation. I mentioned this already. You can mix Cobra oils and auxiliaries with traditional oils and you maintain a four to one ratio. This is the manufacturer recommendation. The paint will retain its water miscibility. I've been able to use a two to one ratio and I teach with that ratio all the time. Uh, there are a few colors that resist that because of the pigment surface uh, tension, but almost all of the paints will mix uh, with uh, this ratio uh, for sure. Don't exceed one to one ratio of paint with water. This is actually a similar recommendation of oils with solvent. So it's recommended with any oil paint not to mix it more than one to one with a solvent to do so mitigates the integrity of the paint film. So imagine the little oil molecules, uh, they have to bond together to create a paint film. The more solvent you add, the more dispersed they get and it's harder for them to connect, create a strong paint film. They will over time, um, but the recommendation by most paint manufacturers is this ratio here. Of course, artists bust this ratio all the time, right? We put a tiny little bit of paint into a lot of solvent and paint or underpainting, but we put other layers of paint over the top of that and that's what creates the final, uh, final paint film. Uh, and the same thing with Cobra. If you mix too much water in it, uh, you can uh, you know, challenge the integrity of the paint film. Um, ways to get around that 
uh, are to uh, mix one-to-one -one ratio of medium, like the painting medium with water, which creates a very fluid uh, uh, mixture, uh, and then mix that with any amount of paint so you can get those wonderful wash techniques and not have to worry about the integrity of the paint film. Really only important if you're putting those kind of washes on as your final layer. Um, not an issue if you're painting and underpainting because you're going to be putting other layers of paint over the top of it. Uh, and any, before we jump into the film, were there any questions on that? Um, I think we have a couple questions, but um, not specifically on that. Okay, um, well, we'll swing around back at the end if anybody yeah. has some more. Uh, before we're done today, though, I wanted to announce this. Uh, we have a new film out called The Peasants. Mm -hmm. uh, if you saw Loving Vincent, fantastic film, entirely hand-painted with our Van Gogh oil paints, this film, uh, The Peasants, is 100% hand-painted with our Cobra oils. Uh, there were 70 artists involved. They worked in four different studios in Poland and Ukraine. Uh, when the war broke out, they all moved their operations into Poland. Uh, 200,000 combined hours of painting. Just think about that. It's incredible, isn't it? Way over the 10,000 hours to become a master. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, 1,300 liters of Cobra oil paint were used. Uh, so an incredible amount of paint. It just mm -hmm. premiered in Toronto in the film festival. I haven't read any of the reviews yet, so I'm excited to see those come out. Uh, and it should be out in cinemas here later uh, in November. Uh, and that's certainly into the holiday season. Uh, you can look up more information on the film at thepeasantsmovie.com. But I've got some fun images for you here. This is some of the artists at work uh, and some details of them in their little cubicles. So you can see uh, in this one, for example, they shoot the action in live action first, and then the artists create the images frame by frame, altering them slightly in kind of a stop motion animation process. Uh, and it's really cool to see how they lay out their palettes because they have to add to the same painting for multiple frames, right? So they have to have all those colors handy. Uh, and really fun to see uh, the cobra uh, in action there. Here's one close-up of a finished one. I love the little paint swatches at the bottom of it that they were going back into as they moved the face or hair or something, a small position uh, to show what's going on. And then this next picture is really fun uh, of all these different paintings that came out of this process. Isn't that cool? That is so incredible. Isn't that fun? I, I just is, love it. It's just The concept of this blows my mind every time. <laughs> I know it. I'm I know so it. Just, excited. I mean, the number of people, the number of hours, how much paint is done. I know. Uh, and they they really enjoyed the Cobra. And this was a lot of feedback for a production company, as opposed to when they were doing Loving Vincent. Not having to have solvents made the studio environment so much safer. They didn't have to worry oh, about yeah. the ventilation in the same way. They mm -hmm. didn't have to worry about the disposal of solvents or the main maintenance of solvents in the studio. So it really freed them up. Uh, in many ways, uh, not only for health and environment, but just convenience and enjoyment. Uh, so Cobra really played an important role for a lot of these artists to put those hours in, right? Oh, yeah. And here I'm going to play a trailer. So here it comes, you guys. I've not done any Cobra.
Pretty incredible, huh? That is just, uh, I could watch it all day. My goodness. It's just amazing <laughs> to, to uh, think of like the frame where they're panning that room at the dance and how that had to be painted or in that last image of her in the rain, uh, see oil paintings come to life. It's just, just really incredible. Yeah, I cannot wait for that to, to hit and be able to watch that. That's going to be an amazing. I'm going to watch it over and over again. <laughs> It's, yeah, I, I did with Loving Vincent. I can't remember how many times I watched it, oh, yeah. but it was just enthralling. And this story looks really intense and good as well. So it should be really fun. Um, I wanted to share this before we uh, get into the giveaway and the Q&A. Uh, anything and everything you ever want to know about Cobra, uh, we have this online magazine. You can uh, take a screenshot here or scan that QR code and, and get to it. It has artist testimonials. It has the information on the paint. Uh, it's got a little article by yours truly uh, and lots of other great information uh, from everybody uh, about everything and everybody uh, involved with the making of the paint. So really fun to read. All right. I'm going to stop Yay. the share here. There we go. <laughs> but fun. Hopefully some good information some for folks there and some uh, excitement for the new movie. I'm excited to see it. Oh, yeah. For sure. Um, now, I know we have a few questions that I did get to, um, and I have a couple more that I'm probably not going to ask while we're uh, live here just because they're a little off topic, but we'll go back through and we'll answer them in writing, of course. Um, but uh, we did have someone asking, um, uh, with the Cobra oils, uh, can you use the Cobra oils as your initial painting? like you're underpainting and then use traditional oils on top of that. Yes, no problem. Wonderful. Uh, and then the other one that I have written down here is how do you know that your oil painting is fully dry? Like if you were to go to varnish it, what what's something that you look for to know that? So really it's the date, the timing. Um, yes because it can become dry to the touch and feel like it's completely dry, but still be oxidizing. Oil paint not only oxidizes from the surface, but also from the ground. Um, so there are parts of it that could still need to dry that you wouldn't be aware of just by touching it. So really we give a, a general rule of six to nine months, depending on the thickness of the paint. So if you're painting a la prima and relatively thin layers of paint in six months, you can varnish. Uh, if you've really been hitting it heavy with the palette knife, building multiple layers of glazes, you want to wait nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, after nine months, it should be thoroughly uh, oxidized and ready. Now, there are products out on the market, uh, retouch varnishes, for example, mm -hmm. that can be used. Um, Gamvar is a product made by Gamblin that's used by a lot of folks that can be used when the, the paint is dry to the touch. It allows the paint layer to continue to oxidize. Mm -hmm. uh, oiling out is a great technique too. Say it's only been a couple months, but it's definitely dry to the touch and you want to kind of bring the colors back to life. You can mix a little bit of, for a Cobra, you take a little bit of the painting medium, put it on a soft cloth, kind of test a corner. And if it doesn't pick up any of the paint, uh, then you can just slowly rub that across the whole surface and that'll unify the surface sheen uh, uh, and uh, give you a nice look too. So oiling out is a, a real common practice, traditional way of, of kind of evening out the surface of an oil painting. And actually, uh, we have a brand new product that is similar to Gamvar. It's called Studio, uh, not, I'm sorry, it's called Instavar. I almost said Studio Solve. Studio cool. Solve is a colorless mineral spirit. Um, but Instavar, is uh, a, a varnish that you can apply when it's touch dry as Fantastic. well. Fantastic. Yeah, that's cool. Super it. convenient. Yeah. Have you used it yet or not yet? I have. And you know what? I'm going to have to send you a little sample just because Ooh, I do. Yeah, it. I would love it. So good. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. But that was the questions that I have. Um, I believe uh, I was trying to scroll back and see because I know that there was one more, but I cannot seem to find it. <laughs> so I will make sure to answer all of the questions if I if I missed it. Um, We'll answer it, you know, through writing as well. And I'll do my best over the next couple of days too to to scroll through and answer as many folks' questions as possible. But I do believe we are itching to see uh, that the giveaway. Question: We got what a giveaway. Yes. 
So the rule, so I'm going to ask the question and then they're going to write, write down the answer in the comments, correct? Uh, yes. So in order to uh, be part of this giveaway, they just have to put the answer in our live chat and we will give them, of course, 15 minutes from the time that we end our show to get their answers entered. And then after that 15 minutes, it's cut off. All right. And then you pick what the first person with the correct answer or something like that? Uh, no, I put everyone's name in a hat and we pull oh. a name out that way. That I way it's it. nice and fair. You know? Nice and fair. I love that. So you got some time to think about. It doesn't have to be Speedy Gonzalez. Yes. All right. So I talked a little bit about in the very beginning, the origin of the term Cobra and why we use Cobra to name the paint. Uh, it was a wonderful art movement post-World War II uh, by artists from what three cities? Ah. And remember, it was the names of these three cities that were put together to create Cobra uh, for their movement and what we used to create the name for the paint. Awesome. So the three well, cities. So you just need to write down the names of those three cities that were used to come up with the name for the line Cobra. I like it. All right. And I'm already starting to see them come through in the chat. I love that. And of course, <laughs> I will be going through and pulling your names. It's always time stamped. Uh, and I can always make sure that spelling... I'm going to up the ante too. We've got, I'm going to do three winners. So you can pick three names. All right. All right. So let me, let me bring myself up here real quick. There I am. So of course I will uh, not count uh, spelling against you because let's be honest, <laughs> I'm the world's worst with that. <laughs> but uh, as long as you get the answer correct, we will include you in the giveaway. Your name will be put into the hat only one time. I'm not giving you 30, three different entries. So only one time. Uh, and then we will mix it up and pull a winner within a week. So usually within seven days of us ending the show. So. Sounds good. Yay, exciting. And then actually not a winner now. We're going to be pulling three winners. I'm very excited about this. So <laughs> you guys get your answers in the chat. Um, and I, yeah, it's our chats are blowing up over here. So uh, <laughs> awesome. yay. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everybody, thank for, you tuning for tuning in. Us. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for all the incredible information uh, about Cobra oil paints. I know it's always just such a confusing subject for people. Um, it's it's water and oil. How does that work? You know, but um, once you explain it, it, it makes so much sense and like the yeah. science behind it and why it works. So it's so fun. Now mm -hmm. you have the recipe to go and make your own water mixable. Yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing soon. <laughs> I actually play. tried it once a long time ago in a demo. We uh, I talked about tempera. And so we took an egg yolk uh, and we added a little Rembrandt oil paint to the egg yolk mixed it up and we were able to mix water into the mixture it was pretty fun that is so cool yeah. very cool well i'm gonna have to mess with that just just because <laughs> but everyone thank you so much for watching of course jeff thank you for being here it's been yeah, a blast my pleasure. and uh we were just talking about this this is our last show together for the year so we will see you next year for sure see you everybody um, yes down and, the road uh, yeah Everybody, though, watching, you better join us next week. Uh, I will not be on. It will be Mott. Mott is going to be doing a portrait painting with our brand new Oasis brushes. So if you were interested in the Oasis brushes and want to see more about those, you better join us next week. All right. You Thanks, guys everybody. Thanks, Emmy. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>